All right, so today I'm going to walk through some work that uh, we've done in the past year uh, in my group. I work in the AWS AI group. We support a number of different products and services, and we focus on a number of computer vision tasks. Uh, one of them is kind of deep diving into video and understanding what we can do more in video. So we're trying to, as the panel discussion was talking about, understand how do we model video and the motion specifically in video. So this is all work that we've done in the past year. Uh, a lot of it is under submission, uh, though some of it has been accepted to the CVPR as well. Uh, so I'm gonna start with video classification, which is the kind of simplest, as I think of it, video task. You have a clip and you're trying to apply a label to it, but the diversity of videos is still quite high. Here I'm showing a number of different data sets. These aren't all classification data sets, but I like to uh, look at these and think about the, both the diversity in actions, but also the, the type of video. Uh, there's egocentric video that Kristen was just talking about. There's uh, movies, which we have a great interest in understanding. And there, there's the web type video here, uh, like kinetics. All right, so the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is using transformers. This is a hot topic. We even discussed it in the um a uh, panel discussion so the hopefully most of you know I'll, I'll talk about it very quickly there's this new video or um, vision transformer that takes instead of a cnn the whole thing is uh, attention-based architecture uh, the you break up an image into patches and you feed that into a transformer encoder and you have this little um class embedding that you can attach a multi-layer perceptron and get a classifier out of it. So we wanted to say, okay, how is this gonna uh, act in videos? And so I'm gonna walk through our uh, kind of initial experiments that we've done there and mostly focus on the finding and how, how transformers treat video separately uh, from I3D type networks. So here's a, a representation of a video. We have five frames. We can break them up into patches and convert that into a sequence of patches and feed that through into this transformer architecture. We can also try cube-based patching and feed that into a transformer architecture. Uh, now, this is one of the few slides I'll have with equations, but the, the point here is that the encoder that we have, um, if you do this naively, you either need very large patches and few frames or we need to do something because the attention maps get very large quite easily. So what we did is we split up the uh, temporal attention from the spatial attention here, uh, and that allowed a great reduction in memory and also allowed us to train on a larger set of frames. Okay, and then the other trick we used in this work is we did about halfway through, so like on the sixth encoding feature, we did top K pooling and we found this was just an interesting side note if anybody's working in this area, I think a lot are, that doing top K pooling on the standard deviation allows you to half the feature dimension uh, or the number of words essentially in your encoder, but uh, still maintain accuracy. And then we, we really use it to max out um, the number of frames that you can put in, but also have some slides uh, talking about efficiency. So these, these end up being quite efficient. All right. Uh, okay, so the interesting things about this. So, so this uh, a direct application of transformers on video, but how do they behave? I think that's where things get interesting. So on the left here, I have a breakdown on first class and there's a fairly large difference in the classes that have accuracy gain versus the classes that have an accuracy loss when comparing to I3D. So that's a class. What ends up happening from our analysis that I find quite interesting is that the video actual instances that have either large camera motion, here I'm showing large camera motion, or shot boundaries, the transformer is able to reason about them better than I3D is. Whereas when we have 
uh, videos that are pretty much the same theme. The camera isn't moving or it's a repetitive task that keeps getting performed. I3D does better, actually better than, than the video transformer uh, in our experiments. And so I think that their I3D is really leveraging the repeated uh, confirmation of that task and average pooling. I would like to understand why the transformer doesn't isn't quite able to capture those repetitive patterns as much, but I think, I think the I3D structure naturally, anything that's um, reoccurring, naturally it can pick that, those kind of motions up much better, whereas the transformer is very powerful at uh, capturing these non-uniform, non, more non-structured aspects of video. Okay, and so I mentioned briefly that it's quite efficient. So if you look at X3D, which is a very efficient uh, 3D network that's popular, uh, recently came out in flops, uh, the transformer is still higher. But if you look at the actual throughput, and I will say that recently X3D came out with a improvement. It's over here about now. We just ran those experiments two days ago. Um, but the depth-wise convolution is still harder to fit on the GPU. And so if you're looking at efficiency, these transformer-based architectures fit in GPU and are quite efficient to compute, even if they have slightly more flops. What's uh, also quite interesting is if you take a lightweight I3D network and ensemble this, this is more for the people interested in doing competitions, this is a very powerful ensemble. And that's because these transformers and the uh, I3D-based networks seem to be capturing quite different information. All right, and now let's look at what's happening inside these transformers. So what we did here is we show the rollout, the attention rollout visualization on the spatial attention. And so the image-based attention we talked earlier, we could maybe use just a image-trained uh, transformer network to apply to kinetics and the problem there is that it's going to fire like this one does, so this is spatial tension, and it's firing just on the face, whereas the spatial temporal tension is actually being able to find where the key action of interest is within that clip. Uh, looking further, we looked at how does the attention behave through the different layers. So this is fairly expected. The early attention uh, layers will have not too much informative information. It's hitting around the edges of the frame. Whereas as you go down the stack, the final one is able to pick up the climber quite well. And even, I didn't see it originally, pick up the climber in the all the way left small area of the frame and ignore the irrelevant pieces. And this is coming from that attention mechanism and also that top K pooling that maintains only the informative inf part of the video. And so I think there's a lot of promise here to design more video specific uh, modelings within the transformer architecture and decouple the way we treat the space and the time dimensions. And so I think that this is a promising direction for modeling this motion. Uh, oh, one last piece is if we look at some failure cases, to understand where I3D is failing. A lot of it comes up where there's non-uniform um, non scene, a lot of different things happening, and the I3D with average pooling pulls out, in this case, rowing, because this somewhat looks like rowing. But the transformer is able to attend really well to this fishing pole and this boy holding the fishing pole here. All right, uh, so that's for classification for, we wanted to also look at where we can apply these transformers for action detection, because there's this great work from uh, Dieter that uses transformers to do detection. So we fairly directly uh, took the Dieter framework. We take an I3D embedding instead of a 2D embedding of a video and we decode into bounding boxes here instead of a uh, class label being different objects, it's going to be different actions and it's a multi label problem. The real trick here is if we're going to input a tube or a, a volume of video, 
we need to figure out how do you parameterize these queries. A query could represent one object through time across the video from a single query. It could be done by independent queries for each frame. The data sets that we use here often aren't annotated with tracking, but there's implicit tracking uh, in the fact that the person performing the same action. And we wanted to take advantage of all those pieces. What we came up with was that there was still a query per, per bounding box per frame, but they were linked together into sets of queries that we call a two. So in this case, here's an example of a person, they're walking and then seen in the next shot through a shot boundary. And so one tube should handle all of that. And when they're not visible, then we get a null, uh, a, a null query for that tube. Okay, so dig into a little bit more of how this works. The encoder takes in the I3D features and is pretty much untouched from the traditional encoder. And then we have, again, the spatial temporal separation of the self-attention layer. So first, our queries come in. This represents a tube. So this is over time, and this is a number of queries on the same frame. We get the queries from the frame, we have we run uh, self-attention on them. Then we take queries from a tube and run self-attention on those. And that's how we do the spatial temporal reasoning. The key to make this work is how you do your query initialization. So for each frame, in our case, we have 15 queries. And the majority of the query is initialized just how you would with a frame-based detector where each one is initialized with a different set and then of, of parameters, and those are learned over time. And so roughly blue could correspond to the top right of the image, and green could be bottom left. But then also for queries from the same frame, they all get a unified encoding. And so this encoding represents frame 0, 1, 2, 3. And that way, the uh, decoder is able to reason about both frames and uh, objects in those frames. Okay, so let's look at some of the results. One of the design choices here is since each query is an object on a frame, that query could look at data from the encoder that comes from just that frame or it could look from the whole video. We call that long band versus short band. And what happens is if an encoder on this last frame looks at the whole video, it tends to hallucinate bounding boxes from previous frames. And so what we found is a short band uh, where this the, it queries from this frame only can see features from that frame uh, as well works better. But we believe that with more data or different network architecture, we're able to just take the whole volume of data and infer on it completely because that would be the ideal way to treat these kind of things. You wanna have all that context. That said, the encoder has already had an attention mechanism that has shared context between frames. So something perhaps that's not necessary, but it's definitely an area for future work. All right, and now I wanna look at the attention. So given this query output, we look at what parts of the frame are being attended to across the whole video clip. And here's that visualization. This is a fairly simple example, but you'll see that each person is attended to by their respective location across the video. And finally, uh, another really promising direction that came out of this, I mentioned earlier that in these data sets, there is an explicit annotation for tracking. But the way that these tubes are structured, we found that tracking emerged naturally without explicit supervision. So here you have this woman in this shot and then across these two shots, but the prediction for her bounding box comes from the same query tube. And so we associate that tube as the same person. Uh, and we found very little ID switches. This is uh, still ongoing. We need to do a little more analysis, but in, and, and much of this is uh, qual quantitative, qualitative, not quantitative at this point, due to that lack of tracking. 
uh, annotation, but we're continuing to pursue and look at if we can use these kind of data sets to uh, infer tracking because the actions that people are performing give a indication of if that person is the, the same person and then as well as their visual appearance. All right, so here's a couple examples. Uh, on the right is a failure case. You still get some of that hallucinated bounding boxes happening here. But overall, the network is able to uh, predict actions across a wide range of data sets, AVA, UCF 101, uh, and a number of others. All right, so I looked a little bit, I talked a little bit about how transformers can be applied to video and how there's some initial promising results in how they're able to um, model the motion. Uh, next, I'll talk about how can we take, well, first we're gonna look at what the nat natural behavior is of these networks. This has been discussed quite a bit uh, when we train them and then look at how we can do self-supervision that encourages or actually forces the network to learn motion and how that can help the end-to-end -end performance. So here's uh, an example from the kinetics data set. It's a pretty typical representation of playing tennis. And what happens with a lot of these even 3D networks is they learn from examples like this and they learn that the context is really what matters. So when you get an example like this one here on the right, it's predicted as playing tennis, even though that's not the action. And on the bottom right, it's not predicted as playing tennis, even though the motion is very similar to the motion on the left because it's in a parking lot. So it's out of context and the network's clearly not able to pick up on the motion cues and is just look, looking at the visual. So what we wanna do is take a self-supervised approach on a large scale uh, data set of videos and explicitly force motion. The, we looked at the literature and there's been quite a lot and there's some very good work here, but none of it is uh, focused on that motion aspect. And along with that, uh, there's this explosion in contrastive learning. So we thought we wanted to take advantage of contrastive learning and try and explicitly model motion in videos. Now, there have actually been works that looked at this as a very fast moving field. This is something that this year's CVPR, looking at contrastive learning for video, where you take clips of the same video and use that as your pairs, your, your pairs of the same object or same uh, instance, and then push those apart away from uh, clips from other videos. And the problem with this is if you look at two clips from the same video, the motion is very, very different. And so this is gonna exacerbate the problem that we saw where the network's really gonna rely on detecting objects because there's no motion similarity here. The, the only thing the network can learn is, oh, I see an ironing board, I see an iron perhaps, so that's only in one of the videos. There's a washing machine in the background, but not, nothing that related to the motion. So there have been a couple um, works that I'd like to call out. We're not the first that try to uh, use cues like optical flow in the self-supervised learning context, but they do this implicitly or use the flow to guide some of the learning. And this work, what we're trying to do is explicitly distill the information in the motion clip back into the visual, forcing the visual CNN to be able to at least represent what's uh, extracted by a motion CNN. We start with uh, visual to visual contrastive learning, very similar to the work at this year's CVPR, uh, where you take a clip and you take subclips out of that and you have a visual CNN like a, a I3D that push those subclips together. And then we augment this with a motion CNN that takes something like a optical flow as input where there's no uh, visual information. This is a lighter weight CNN. And then we force the representation out of the motion CNN and the visual CNN to be closer together, just in the typical contrastive learning 
methodology and you can push motion what dissimilar motion from different video clips away and you can push together a similar motion from the same video clip. And then there's a design choice around the motion representation and you can do frame differencing, optical flow, or what we found to be best is these optical flow edges. So you run an edge detection on optical flow and that gives you motion boundaries. So here's some examples of those. Now, when we force our visual network that's run on this data to uh, be similar to the motion network that's run on this data, it encourages the visual network to latch onto motion. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the numbers. Uh, those can be looked up in details in the paper, but it does do better on the various different tasks on multiple data sets. What I think is most illustrative of how this works well is on a low shot learning uh, task on UCF 101. So we have kinetics as our unlabeled data set, or in the case of supervised, you have kinetics pre-trained network that's trained in the supervised setting. We have the contrastive learning set up here where we just use RGB, you take a clip, you take two subclips and say that the features should be close together. And that works fairly well, but you add the distance and as soon as you get about 20% of the training data uh, from UCF, we're already very, very close to the supervised setting. So we're able to extract a meaningful embedding that works well for few shot learning. Uh, and here's some re visual representation of what we end up with. So on the top is the uh, areas of the video that are firing for our uh, motion distillated model. And on the bottom are the RGB only. And you see that it's really looking at the background context for RGB only, and that's why it's making the wrong prediction. Here's some other examples. Again, the, the motion distillation is forcing the network to really attend to those areas of the video. All right, and, and one last piece uh, on video classification. We had this work where we're focused on efficient video classification. So here you have a long video chunk. Typical, what we do is we take this long video chunk, it's the kinetics, you know, 10 second video, we break it up into smaller chunks. We feed it through our I3D. This is commonly referred to as like 30 crop method. We get 30 predictions and we do late fusion, but this can be fairly inefficient. So in this work, we said, okay, we take any pre-trained I3D network. We pass the whole video chunk through the, the beginning of it, first two or three stages. Then we train a very lightweight feature compressor that takes this long, feature with the long temporal dimension to a short temporal dimension and then feed that through the tail in one pass. So instead of 30 crops, we have one across the whole video and the aim is to get the same performance but with a much uh, lower runtime. So it does that. So if you bolt on our feature compressor uh, here, you can see a huge reduction in uh, gigaflops. And in addition, you could say, okay, well, I could just take fewer crops. So if you take the same network and you reduce the crops from 30 to three, of course you get 10 X faster runtime, but the accuracy is significantly lower down here. And then here's a exploration of different configurations and backbones along this throughput versus accuracy timescale. But the reason I'm talking about it uh, in this talk about motion is that the compressor actually learns to pick up on those motion features. So what's visualized here is the compressed dimension, basically the attention that the compressor is uh, paying to the individual frames. So here we get, this is pretty trivial, this perhaps isn't motion, it's just getting rid of irrelevant frames. Here it's focused on this part of the segment where the child is actually swinging and removes a part except maybe one frame here, right? So we get one context frame here and the rest is focused on that diversity and that motion. When it's fairly uniform and they're all equally informative, we get a nice diagonal. And when it's 
important to see the context, but at the very end, you get that key action. We get a much higher attention towards that. All right, and in the last, I guess, 10 minutes I have left, I'm gonna talk about a different task, tracking. Tracking, it's much harder to completely ignore the temporal domain because it's it's a requires temporal information. And so here's an example. This is uh, when we talk about tracking, we're looking at multi-object tracking. Uh -oh, my videos, there it goes. Uh, and this is tracking call cars and, and people when they get close enough, the detector will recognize them. So quite a different domain, but still in, in video. Uh, one of the first works we did in this domain is how to you take the great work that was done in Tractor, which is basically taking a two-stage detector and using that as a regressor to find the object in the next frame. We applied that for uh, single shot detectors. So when you, in this case, you have uh, an anchor, when you have a detection from frame T minus one, and the anchor, which is the dotted line, you can project that anchor into the next frame at frame T. You can modify, uh, you can move it with some motion estimation or even leave it where it is, and then use that anchor to regress the location of that same object in the next frame. The advantage of this is it's a very lightweight tracker uh, and you can just bolt it on to any single shot detection algorithm, but it suffers from a similar issue that Tractor does as well, which is you're only regressing to frame T without any visual information in frame uh, T minus one. And so the next thing, and, and this is presented at this CVPR, uh, that we looked at is how do we uh, explicitly model that motion uh, in the in the video by looking at both the frame, the previous frame and the current frame. And so this is our uh, general framework. First, it, it's a two-stage detector where you take the frame, you pass it through a, a backbone, and you get some PN features and we detect all the objects in the frame. And then the tracking is done through the, our Siamese tracker. And we explore a number of different ways to design the Siamese tracker, but all of them have in common that you take the R line features from the previous frame, you compare them to a region in the next frame and determine where that object has moved. And the, the key here is that it's using the visual information from both frames. And then we associate the uh, detections and the tracks together with a, a fairly simple solve. All right, so, so what can we use for motion models? So if we just regress as we did in our previous work or in Tractor did, uh, it works quite well. But like I said, it's taking a region from the previous frame, it's regressing, so it's trying to detect the best object in that region in the next frame without any kind of visual information. So if two people cross, there's nothing to say, oh, I want to be associated to the person in the black shirt instead of the person in the white shirt. You can take a flow field. That's a, a pretty uh, good starting point. So you can, optical flow obviously uses the visual information from both frames. But we extend this with two different motion models, which we find explicit modeling of the motion, similar to our self-supervised work, really gives a big improvement there. So here, what we do is we take the features from frame T minus one and T, we concatenate them and send them through a multi-layer perceptron. We call this an implicit motion model because there's no matching, explicit matching. And here we take inspiration from flow networks where we use correlation filters to explicitly match. And this goes back to kind of single, classical single object detectors that we've built into um, a multi-object detector native. This outperforms the previous work and it, it really shines in the fact that it can continue these tracks for a long period of time. So here's that explicit motion model. And the main thing is that the max ID here is seven, whereas all these other models are 
having a lot more ID switches or having issues as people deform and move in and out of shadows. And so here's a look at what that looks like in practice on a kind of in the wild video. And you'll notice tracking is reasonable, but there are a large number of ID switches. So I think we're far from solving this problem. And in many tracking workshops, there'll be lots of discussion around what the right metrics are. But I like to show this because we're doing quite well, but we're still a fairly far. Now, one downside of having this end-to-end -end, uh, tracking infrastructure that works on videos directly is we need to train it on videos. And so a number of other end-to-end uh, -end tracking methods do this, where they start with an annotated image set, maybe crowd human. You apply transformation, zoom in, zoom out, along with data augmentations like motion blur, color jittering, compression artifacts, and you get these simulated videos. So here, this looks pretty good. It looks like a video, but the people aren't deforming. So in this work, what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna look at two aspects. One, how do you generate these videos to make them most, more realistic? And so we have a set of, you know, bag of tricks to really get these hallucinated videos to uh, give the network the diversity that they need from images. And then, on top of that, we're going to mine for hard, unlabeled, uh, we're going to mine for hard tracking examples from unlabeled data. So we were able to mine um, from uh, 50,000 unlabeled videos in the kinetics data set and increase and augment our training data set. When people who aren't looking at tracking, they're like, okay, that doesn't seem that big. But if you look at the MOT data set, which is seven videos, or there's other tra tracking data sets that are tens of videos, 50,000 50, videos is a big jump. And so we do this by first running our tracker, and then we identify likely ID switches in the tracker, and then we aggressively merge them. So this is where our tracker failed. It's likely an ID switch, so we merge it and feed it into training. And we generate these tracks, and send those in as hard mind tracks that have been automatically annotated. We combine both the hallucinated video and these hard mind tracks to create what we call the HBRV or hallucinated video and real video model. And we've got much better performance here. If you look at the woman in the blue, when she deforms on the left and does a spin, she, her track is lost. But on the right, when we have a mind and hallucinated video training, it's able to recover that. All right. The last thing I'll talk about is an application of Pose. So this was a CPR oral we had last year, one of the few works from previous years that I'm talking about. And really briefly, what it does is it takes a stack of frames, takes those as input similar to the uh, action detection based on transformers that we did and outputs small track pose, uh, tracklets of pose. And then we have a way of combining those together to create the key is really smooth tracking results on post track. And I believe this is still state of the art on the post track data set, but it's very smooth. And what I wanna talk about is what we did with this. So. When COVID hit, uh, a lot of people were looking for solutions to how do we structure our space? How do we make sure people are safe? And so we used our high quality pose tracking and we developed a method to automatically calibrate cameras. So on the bottom, you're on this grid is a representation of a six foot by six foot grid. And that's obtained by treating each person as a vector that's perpendicular to the ground plane with uh, assuming that they all have uniform height. And over time, you can estimate a quite accurate ground plane. And from there, we're able to project each person onto an overhead view and determine where there's violations, as well as really determine hotspots for where people might be getting too close together. So this was quite impactful. Uh, we did this almost a year ago now. Uh, and it's some simple methods where you can actually 
I'd like to show it because you can apply the pose estimation that you're working on uh, to these real world problems. All right, so that's a kind of a overview of the work we did in the last year. My main takeaways is that we're, I'm, I'm bullish that we're finally starting to be able to model motion in our video models. Uh, for a long time, it felt like we were treating the temporal dimension just as another spatial one, and that wasn't enough, and that we needed to really treat time separately. I think in a number of ways, we're starting to do that, both with these transformers and a lot of work we're doing in tracking, I think is gonna guide how we treat motion in the classification space. I think there's clear evidence that we can't just hope for the best. We need to structure our models and our training methodologies to guide these networks to focus on motion. And when they do, they're more accurate, which is quite promising. And then uh, the last piece is, I think there's a, a promising area to look at leveraging those motion cues and unlabeled videos to bootstrap our training and also data collection. So we're doing that both in like the tracking hard mining and auto annotation, as well as the classification self-supervised contrastive learning. Uh, here's a list of papers presented, and that's all I have. I thank everybody very much, and I'd like to also put in a plug that we are hiring for interns and full-time, so if any of the things I talked about today are interesting, please let me know. Thanks.